Well, uh, the second presentation in the session is also about uh, guided waves, in this case, in this case, guided wave tomography. And I'll update you on the recent developments that, that we are uh, currently uh, working on. Um, basically, the whole idea behind this when we started this some, some years ago is that uh, installations uh, are aging and um, uh, basically <coughs> the effort of, of safely maintaining installations becomes more and more. And, and the idea was that with permanently installed sensors, which essentially would give you the same information as, let's say, uh, normal ultrasonic uh, inspections. Um, you could basically reduce the, the cost of, uh, of inspections. That was initially where we started at, uh, with the idea that when you have um, permanently installed sensors, you can basically monitor the condition uh, of the installation and detect changes in, in the degradation rate. That's basically schematically depicted here, where this is basically time and this is integrity and the installation starts degrading and um, with time uh, the condition basically deteriorates but also the uncertainty about the actual condition uh, becomes larger and larger. And then you do, for example, an inspection, repair something and then the, 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 the condition uh, improves and basically the whole process repeats itself. But sometimes you have unexpected uh, things in installations which uh, rapidly increases the degradation rate and you can have failures, meaning that the condition drops or the integrity drops below a certain, so below a certain level. So the whole idea that we had uh, is that with permanently installed sensors you could monitor the degradation rate of your installation, also uh, detect changes in degradation rate and um, with much less uncertainty and hence more effectively run the installation. Well, uh, as many things in real life, things uh, ended up a little bit differently. Now the focus is on, on inspection instead of permanent monitoring because uh, applications like pipe support uh, really raised a lot of interest uh, to use this technology to map the wall under a pipe support. So the whole idea, and now I contradict myself a little bit uh, with the previous presentation, the whole idea uh, in guided wave tomography is that basically you, you need two rings of sensors in order to localize the defect and quantitatively size it as well. So uh, when you only have one pair of sensors, it's impossible to distinguish these three situations, uh, location of the defect, but also it's, it's challenging, let's put it this way, uh, to make it the distinction between uh, a long, shallow defect and a much more localized, uh, deep defect. And principally, you could um, use uh, either one of the two fundamental modes, basically the, the A0 or, or the S0. Um, we prefer to use the S0, uh, basically because it's the first uh, signal arriving, making it much easier to get a, a clear, uh, clear signal. And uh, with the A0 mode, the refraction effects in, in defects uh, are much more pronounced and you could, could get all kind of focusing, uh, focusing effects. So, for the ones who were here the first uh, presentation, this is basically the concept. You have two rings of sensors. Uh, one element in the ring is transmitting, the other elements on the opposite ring uh, are receiving the waves. Uh, and you repeat that for all uh, transmitters around the circumference. You take into account uh, higher order helical modes the whole idea is that uh, we use rays, so to say, up to plus or minus 45 degrees, at least. Uh, and that's required for a proper sizing of defects. And then basically it's the distance between the rings which determines how many higher order helical modes you need to, in to include in order to achieve this plus or minus 45 degree. When you are at, at 8 or 10 meters apart, uh, you need to have plus or minus 15 uh, a helical order path, while when uh, you're at two or four meters, then it's uh, it's just uh, three or four, uh, then it's sufficient. Again, uh, from uh, these measurements, we extract uh, travel times, and uh, these travel times are input for a nonlinear inversion scheme. The whole idea about 
the non-linear inversion scheme is that when you approach it from an inversion side, uh, it's much easier to deal with uh, having limited uh, aperture, uh, so you're not assuming anything about uh, the data that you don't have. Uh, well, when you use a back projection approach, you essentially set, set the data that you don't have to zero, uh, and that causes much more uh, artifacts. Um, from years ago, we've done a joint industry project where uh, we worked on uh, different types of, uh, of pipes, machined uh, different types of defects, varying in, in, uh, in diameter and in uh, wall loss. And based on that, we got a first assessment uh, of what you can do with, the, with the, this technology. Uh, we've seen that basically sizing uh, of defects is in the order of 7%. Uh, of uh, the nominal wall thickness, that's uncertainty. For uh, detection, um, uh, we try to make a comparison to other uh, uh, guided, uh, yeah, guided wave systems, and we expressed the detection in terms of the length of the defect, so the, the distance that the wave travels through the defect, and the wall loss at the defect. So it's a little, li little bit similar to, let's say, the circumferential uh, uh, wall loss, but then it is now expressed in terms of length first and uh, times uh, depth. And then we, we looked at what, what can we reliably detect. And at that time, uh, we found that uh, defects with, let's say, length uh, times depth of three centimeters squared was uh, reliably detectable. And when you uh, run the same system in monitoring mode, it was 0.6 centimeters squared. So then you're much more sensitive. In monitoring mode, we found that we could uh, detect a defect of, of about this size with 300 micron molars. So then it's, it's, it's much more sensitive. And we've shown uh, that it's also insensitive to, uh, to coatings. We've done uh, several uh, measurements in the field now, and this is just uh, one to illustrate uh, what you get. Uh, here you see a pipe on the pipe support. Uh, there's some corrosion here. And then this is basically the corresponding tomogram. And um, you see that most of the corrosion is uh, near uh, the edges of the support. And uh, there you find the deepest points. But also here, for example, this lobe is, is this lobe, what you see on the uh, tomogram. So basically, it really gives you a picture of uh, uh, the wall uh, at the location of the pipe support. Uh, last couple of years we uh, worked a lot on uh, developing hardware. Initially we started out with piezoelectric sensors uh, which had to be bonded to a pipe. Uh, that's nice for, for the lab of course, but in the field it's, uh, it's a little bit difficult to use. So um, we basically developed a scanner uh, which uh, could basically we put around the pipe and, and make a full scan. And uh, EMET rings, uh, where here you have an example. It's basically a ring that you clamp around the pipe uh, with these type of EMET sensors in it. And uh, then based on uh, two rings, one here and one here, you collect a full data set. And then when you look at the data, um, it looks a little bit like, uh, like this. Um, without processing, it's very difficult to see anything uh, reasonable. So here are all uh, recordings. You see the S0 wave uh, coming in. Uh, because it was a lab experiment, you see uh, reflections from the end of the pipe, which you're normally not supposed to see uh, in the field. And um, uh, when you have a, a gas pipe, uh, you normally see the A0 uh, wave coming in as well. Uh, when there's liquid, you hardly see that, that one. And then for reference, we also acquire some data uh, with uh, SH0, so torsional wave uh, sensors basically to check the alignment of the rings and uh, get some information about uh, the shear wave velocity in the pipe. And then basically when you uh, do the tomography, uh, this is a result that we obtained in the lab. We machined the defect, uh, which is about 10 centimeters wide in this direction, and uh, I think it was uh, 15 or 20 centimeters in, uh, in this direction. And the wall loss, uh, at the uh, defect was four millimeter. Here in the tomogram you see what's depicted as the remaining uh, wall 
and it shows it has a remaining wall of uh, 4.3 millimeters. So in this case, we're only 0.3 millimeters off. Recently, we've done some measurements in the field as well. And here is, uh, uh, here is a picture. Um, we worked on a number of 14-inch uh, seamless pipe and uh, with a nominal wall thickness of, of 9.5 millimeters uh, and one 18-inch uh, seam welded one with a nominal wall thickness of uh, 11 millimeters. <coughs> this is the result um, for the 18-inch uh, pipe. Basically, as I said, this was a, a welded pipe, uh, so the, the actual welds are here are, and are here. Basically what happens is that these welds act as a kind of a waveguide, guiding the guided waves. Uh, um, and that basically means that um, it leaves a quite clear imprint in the data. So in the tom tomogram you'll see the, the, the welds. Of course in real life they're much more uh, narrow than depicted here. Uh, that's simply because of, let's say, resolution uh, aspects. But you really can see them. Um, and then uh, you have to conclude that and there's also a circumferential weld, obviously, otherwise this couldn't happen. And indeed, there is one, but uh, circumferential welds, you, you don't see them in the, in the tomog uh, tomography because they let's say that the, the local increase in wall thickness due to the weld cap is so little, uh, you cannot resolve that in the tomography. And then here, um, we have a defect, uh, obviously at the six o'clock uh, position, and uh, um, it was sized as a remaining wall of 8.3 millimeters. The problem here is a little bit uh, difficult. It turned out that this is really uh, a cluster of three or four deeper pits with a, with a diameter of less than a centimeter or so. Uh, and obviously you cannot see that with this technique. Uh, so you have to be a little bit careful interpreting uh, the tom tomograms because in these situations, uh, pitting, if it's present, uh, you get a too shallow uh, depth reading. And uh, in this case, I think the pits were about <coughs> one and a half millimeter deeper uh, than the depicted remaining wall because that's simply uh, outside the resolution of what we can see with this uh, with this technology. So you have to be a little bit careful. Then here are some results on uh, on the 14-inch uh, pipes. I'll just check the time. Yeah, still doing okay. Um, the challenge with seamless pipe is that uh, the nominal wall thickness uh, tends to uh, vary quite a lot in the order of, well, according to specs, uh, plus or minus 12%. In real life, you find even a little bit more, but, but so that makes it a little bit challenging because you have to map uh, the wall thickness of the pipe, and these wall thickness variations are really much more than, uh, let's say, the, the travel time changes due to uh, local defects. But these were the results that we uh, obtained um, so far, uh, and there was no independent ver verification of these results. So what I did is at least I compare them to what you visually see, whether at least the location, the, the location of the, the corrosion is mapped correctly. So here, basically, we had the sensor rings two meters apart. This is the circumference again, and here uh, you see at the location of the pipe support, you see uh, corrosion uh, being present. Here, uh, there seems to be a little bit of of corrosion, but it really doesn't stand out compared to, let's say. Uh, the local wall thickness variations around that area. Then here's another result which had a little bit more complicated uh, morphology of the corrosion. Um, here you see that basically the pipe support doesn't have to be exactly in the middle, it can be uh, anywhere uh, uh, close to one, uh, either one rings. Um, I wouldn't recommend to put the ring just Immediately, nearly immediately in contact with the pipe support, but let's say uh, you can uh, place the rings at a location which is uh, fairly well accessible. So this is the pipe support again, and here you see the different uh, spots of, of corrosion which were uh, 
which were visible from, uh, from outside. Normally what we see is that a lot of corrosion is uh, near the edges of the pipe support, but also along the pipe support itself, you see that there uh, is quite often uh, a bit of corrosion uh, like, like this and uh, like that. Um, we're now first finishing uh, this development and uh, for future work uh, we'll be working on uh, guided wave tomography for bands. That's even a little bit more, more challenging uh, simply because uh, in a band you get geometrical focusing effects. The, the, the guided wave tends to focus at the knee of the band and what happens then is that you get a phase jump uh, in the data which you have to include in, in your forward modeling. Uh, which cannot be done by, uh, by ray tracing. And to illustrate how complicated the wave field is uh, going to be for, uh, for a band, uh, normally when you have, let's say, an unfolded view of a pipe, you would simply get a hyperbola uh, as an arrival. But when uh, uh, you have different band angles, the, waves become, uh, the wave field becomes much more uh, complicated. And uh, well, here for, for this band, you see uh, a lot of multi-valued operator, so meaning that at one receiver you get multiple arrivals uh, due to different uh, paths. But we already shown in the past that at least on synthetic data uh, you're able to, uh, to run the tomography for bands as well. And here are some numerical results showing uh, corrosion at the knee of the band and, and at the side of the knee as well. So uh, we'll be uh, working on that uh, in the near future as well. So. I showed that with the guided wave tomography, uh, you can obtain quantitative wall thickness maps. We've done the first few field trials with, uh, with EMAT sensors, uh, which provide good data quality and an acceptable acquisition time. So far, we only have uh, one channel acquisition, so we have to uh, acquire all combinations separately that takes a little bit, uh, little bit of time. But in the future, we'll move to multi-channel acquisition and then the uh, position time becomes much shorter. At least visually there's a good match between what you project and what you can observe in the field and uh, hopefully in the near future we're able to verify these, uh, these results. We're continuously working on this technology because it's, it's simply very exciting to do so uh, and I hope to uh, report some new results in, uh, in the next presentation. Thank you for your attention. Well, as a chairman, I have to say there's time for maybe one or two questions. Um, <coughs> were the pipes in your examples all empty? No, the 18-inch the was uh, filled with, uh, with uh, a fuel. Does this not uh, affect your, your results? No, uh, of course you have a little bit of attenuation loss, uh, but for S0 waves it's, uh, it's reasonable. No artifacts, additional artifacts? No, the, the only thing that you have to do is be careful, the wave radiates in the liquid, uh, and couple, couples back in on the opposite side of the pipe, uh, so you have a kind of a mirror source, uh, but we can, can basically uh, remove that from the data. At what frequencies yeah, you are working? Uh, depends on, uh, on the wall thickness, of course, uh, but typically it's in the range between uh, 125 and 175 kilohertz as a center frequency. You say your work was at zero moment, you missed the small bit. Uh, yeah, possibly we, we were looking at what you can do uh, at least as a kind of screening to make sure that, that there are no pits or, or indicate that there are pits. That, that's at least the first uh, step we intend to take. Because let's say sizing these small pits uh, remains uh, a challenge.